Good evening, and welcome to the launch of a citizen science project, Belfast Coastal Flooding, Storms and Sea Level Rise. My name is John Beale, and I'm the chairperson of the Belfast City Climate Crisis Committee. The Climate Crisis Committee, in collaboration with the Belfast Free Library and the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, has developed a long-term project to collect information about high water events and sea level rise in Belfast. Tonight, we will describe the, what citizen science is and how this project will work. We hope to get you interested because we want your participation. As we proceed, if you have questions, you can submit them on the YouTube comments section or send an email to B. Harrington at Belfast Library org. We will respond at the end of the presentation. First, we'll have a presentation by our collaborators at Gulf of Maine Research Institute in Portland, Gail Bownis and Sarah Kern. Hello, my name is Sarah Kern. I work for the Gulf of Maine Research Institute where I manage our citizen science work. I'm here with my colleague Gail Bonus, who manages the work that we're doing with communities around sea level rise around the Gulf of Maine. Um, and we are here to share a little bit about the science and the thinking about citizen science that's kind of underpinning this project that we're launching today. Gail, we'll start with you. Thanks, Sarah, and thank you for joining us. We're really excited to share with you um, sea level rise data and projections and what that means for Belfast, and as Sarah said, the role that citizen science can play um, in supporting Belfast with decision making. So to jump right in, let's look at some data. Um, around the globe, we've been collecting data on sea level. So over the past 100 years, we can go back and see what different tide gauges have been measuring. And very clearly from this graph, you can see that the trend is up. So on average as a globe, we've seen a rate of rise between eight and 10 inches. And in the most recent decades, we can see that that rate of rise has started to increase. And the key reasons behind that is that our oceans are warming. And as ocean waters warm, they expand and take up more space. The other main reason is that land ice is melting. So glaciers and ice sheets on land as they melt are contributing new water into our oceans and also increasing that volume and causing sea levels to rise. So how much might sea levels rise? As a globe, we can expect to see anywhere between one, feet, one foot of sea level rise and 8.2 feet by 2100. Um, I'll dig into what these different scenarios mean as we look at a regional scale. And really important to look as regionally as possible because rates of sea level rise around the globe vary quite a bit. In some places, they're rising really quickly. In some places, they're actually decreasing. And the variance is due to uh, ocean currents in specific areas and also increased precipitation and flow out from rivers. And in places where we're seeing sea level decrease, a lot of that is due to land ice melt. And as that weight decreases from the land or from the ice, that land can start to rebound. Um, if you were to zoom right into the Gulf of Maine, you could see that our rate of rise is greater than the global average. So let's see what that looks like. So here in Maine, we can expect to see a sea level rise anywhere from 1.12 feet to 10.79 feet. And this data is specific to the Portland tide gauge. We'll look at the statewide data in just a second. Um, these bottom two scenarios are, well, all of these scenarios are based off of global carbon projections. The bottom two are assuming that as a globe, we cut our carbon emissions yesterday and um, greatly reduced from yesterday on out and also deployed some carbon capture technology that we have yet to invent. So these two scenarios are really unlikely, but they do provide us with some really great visualizations for near-term planning. The middle two scenarios, so 3.84 feet and 6 feet, are assuming that we cut global carbon emissions by 2040 and then drastically reduce from there on out. So that would be as if every country were to enact policies and changes in accordance with the Paris Accord. The top two scenarios, the high and the extreme, are assuming that um, we continue to emit carbon at the same rates and trends that we are today as a globe. So they're kind of the business as usual scenarios. So let's see what these look like in your community. We're going to zoom right into Belfast and look at the statewide data. 
Um, and this regional or statewide data is really great to help us understand which areas are going to be vulnerable first as sea levels rise. But as we explain later, the role of the citizen science project is to help us better understand the specific geography and impacts of uh, wind and water conditions on sea levels in the Belfast Harbor. And that local data will help to make resiliency decisions within your community. But this data is a really great place to start. Uh, so this first map is showing us the highest astronomical tide of 12 feet. And that's a, that's a sea level that we experience a few times a year today. Um, and the rate of experiencing that is starting to increase. Um, and then if we just layer on what that uh, low scenario would look like, so 1.2 feet, um, we see this with a really small storm that happens at high tide pretty frequently throughout the course of the year. You'll start to see some flooding in downtown Belfast. The intermediate low scenario, so 1.6 feet, again, flooding in downtown Belfast, as well as we can start to see some impacts going upriver and probably into those marsh ecosystems. The intermediate scenario of 3.9 feet is where some significant flooding starts to happen downtown. And the high scenario of 6.1 feet is where we'll start to experience flooding impacts almost on a daily or tidal basis. Now the high scenario of 8.8 .8 feet and the extreme scenario of 10.9 feet, we definitely have some flooding that's really impactful. Again, these are assuming that it's a business as usual and really hopefully as a globe, we don't experience this as far as sea level goes. But this data is really great to help us think about well, what happens when there's sea level and storms that come through. We need to consider sea level rise and weather together. So this could be a high scenario with a two to four foot storm surge. So it's a really great visualization for that. So the Gulf of Maine Research Institute is working with coastal communities throughout the state of Maine to provide them with the knowledge, skills, and tools to develop community-focused resilience plans. And we're doing that through various projects. And the project that we're here to share with you all today, we've been working on with the Belfast community is one around citizen science. So I'm gonna pass this off to Sarah to chat more with you about that. Great. Thanks, Gail. So as you all probably know better than we do, um, the city of Belfast has really been a leader in how thinking about how a community responds to climate change uh, proactively. And a climate change committee was formed over two years ago. Now, in two years ago this month, they published their report about sea level rise, which was the first aspect of climate change that they took on. And this report presented two conclusions. One was there was insufficiently detailed data available for what was happening in Belfast um, for the city to make decisions. And Gail alluded to this, but the, where the sea level is, um, has an, is enormously impacted by the shape of the coastline, by the direction of the winds, by the depth of the water. And understanding what will happen in a given place, you really have to study what's happening in that place in order to understand um, how those pieces come together. So this report concluded that they needed more information about Belfast. The report also pointed towards citizen science as a potential strategy for filling in those data gaps. And the great news is that citizen science is, um, because it's a better and better um, established science methodology as time goes by. I like to think about it as a revolution in science practice because it really goes back to the roots of science when it was um, done by people who cared about, had a question or a curiosity that drove them to collect information and analyze it and bring work with other people to collect information to answer their questions and solve their curiosities. To me, citizen science is really about collaboration. It's a collaboration between the people who have the local knowledge about what is happening in a given place with all of the experts um, who can help them collect information and do it in a way that leads them towards answering their question in a satisfying manner. So in Belfast, we had the wonderful opportunity to work with lots of people from the local community. The city was very supportive of this project. 
the Climate Crisis Committee members were um, participants on our design team. They were joined by um, Brenda Harrington from the Belfast Free Library. We had a teacher from the Belfast Area High School. We had someone from the Penobscot Bay Stewards Program. And we had Kathy Pickering, the Harbor Master, all of us working together. And they all shared their essential local knowledge, both about what's happening in town, but also about the kind of people who live in this area and, and what matters to them. We used scientific expertise from people like Gail and from our contact at the National Weather Service, John Cannon, who's really interested in the data that's being collected by this project. Um, filling in that scientific expertise and understanding what's important to collect in terms of information is really is essential. There's also some technical expertise. Um, a couple times we've alluded to other information that's being collected. This citizen science project is absolutely a citizen science project, and we're blending the observations that, that citizens can make um, with data from a brand new weather station and the soon to be installed tide gates that are being installed at the city pier. And again, John Cannon was really helpful about um, figuring out what device to purchase and citing it. Um, and the Ecosystem Investigation Network, this brand new platform for citizen science that the Gulf of Maine Research Institute has created, is also providing some technical expertise and providing a platform and shape um, for the citizen science project to come together. Also, to bring all these different people together, there's necessary process um, knowledge. How do, you, how do you bring these people together? How do you bring these different cultures, the culture of science, the culture of communities, the culture um, of the weather service, all of that together? Well, at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, we've had almost two decades now of experience in creating citizen science projects and working with collaborative teams like this. And the Ecosystem Investigation Network is the platform that we've built um, to support projects that are by and for and with communities throughout the Gulf of Maine who are interested in investigating um, climate change and its impacts in our region. So all of these people together, all of this expertise combined to create the coastal flooding project that we are launching here today. So what is that coastal flooding project about? You're gonna get a whole tour of how to do it. Um, but before we go there, I wanna just remind everyone about the goals of this project. And there are three. The first is to fill in that data gap, to collect um, data on what kinds of weather patterns, um, what kinds of rainfall, what kinds of wind lead to the kinds of flooding that, that might cause problems for areas that matter to people who live in Belfast. Detailed data, number one. Number two though, um, and number three, for a city to make good decisions about the future, it's not just about using data, but it's also combining those data with what the people who live in that city want, what the citizens want. We live in a democracy for better and worse. So this project is also designed to engage people in making observations of flooding and then thinking about how is that flooding impacting them? How is that flooding impacting the community? And where are the places that matter the most? And that practice of evaluating and thinking about the meaning of flooding that we're seeing or other problems is going to be really important as communities move forward um, and figure out what to do about them. So this, the second aspect of that, that this project is going to help with is to um, collect those opinions and collect those valuations um, in a very kind of rigorous and um, structured fashion so that those data are actually ready for people in Belfast and city planners in Belfast to use um, to begin to identify those places that matter the most. And those why places matter could be anything because they're an important economic a piece of economic infrastructure to the town, but it also just might be a place that matters culturally to the history of Belfast. So the project will engage people in making observations of what they're seeing, that kind of hard data, this is where the water was, but also thinking about what it means. You can go forward, Gail, thanks. So this project will live on GMRI's brand new ecosystem investigation network. And we built this platform 
with the sole purpose of supporting citizen science projects throughout the Gulf of Maine watershed and the Gulf of Maine, and intending that it be a place where projects that are posed either by scientists or by communities like Belfast um, can both find the technical support that they need to collect rigorous data and be able to use it for analysis, but also the process support for designing projects that will effectively deliver on both the scientific goals that they have, but also on the community goals and really deliver what communities are after. Thank you again for inviting the two of us to be part of this launch event. We're so excited that it's finally happening. We've been working with the city with a, our design team for a year now. Um, it's been really wonderful. I've, I've had connections with Belfast for many decades and it has a special place in my heart and it's been really, um, it's been a complete pleasure to work with the team and we're so excited that you're leading, um, leading the state, leading coastal communities and thinking about how to plan for and respond um, to climate change. Gail, anything to add? No, um, have fun, collect some data and we can't wait to hear more from you all. Yep, and we'll see you online. Thanks so much. <laughs> So, in case you can't tell from the applause, that was a pre-recorded um, interview so that we wouldn't have any um, Zoom connection problems. So now you've had an outline of sea level rise, its causes and manifestations, and also a discussion about what citizen science can be. I'd like to now introduce a member of our design team, John Tipping. John is a biologist and a member of the board of directors of the Belfast Bay Watershed Coalition, who has been engaged in a citizen science gathering of data in Belfast Bay for some time now. John? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone for watching. Uh, as John said, I'm a biologist here in Belfast and on the board of the Belfast Bay Watershed Coalition. I'd like to talk just briefly about how citizen science can fill in gaps in our knowledge. And I'd like to cite a specific program that's been going on here in Belfast and how it relates to climate change in a slightly different way than uh, the sea level rise program. But it'll give you a good overview of how citizen science uh, can really help us. Um, the Belfast Bay Watershed Coalition has a group that's associated with it called the Penobscot Bay Stewards. And the Penn Bay Stewards, it's a program where people can attend basically two classes a week for a month in the spring, and it's a free program. And there are biologists and environmental science scientists, um, and they have this, these educational opportunities. It's free of charge. And what we ask is that the graduates of the Penn Bay Stewards program contribute 30 hours of volunteer work. And what we've ended up having, the results of this program over the last few years has been incredible. The people who graduate tend to provide far more than 30 hours of service. These uh, folks right here braving the frigid temperatures in Belfast Harbor to take water quality readings have been out doing this for the last two years. And the way this can help fill in gaps for us is uh, as an example, the Maine Department of Environmental Protection has a program where they come up to the harbor and they spend a day and do an incredible amount of collecting water samples and they, they study uh, chemistry samples and they send out samples to chemistry labs to, to study things like phosphorus and nitrogen levels. But they really only have the resources to come to Belfast Harbor a couple of times a year, whereas this group goes out, weather permitting, at least once a week, sometimes multiple times a week. And this data is, it's a very usable data. The data is forwarded to the main Department of Environmental Protection and they're using it in their own analyses. Uh, another example is the Maine Coastal Observation Alliance, which is a collection of groups like the Belfast Bay Watershed Coalition. At this point, there are over 15 coastal organizations. Some of the more local ones are the Dam Riscotta River and Lakes Association, um, the St. George Land Trust, but there are groups all the way down to Casco Bay. 
and the MCOA collects and collates all of this information and produces a report every year. Now, what this group here is is doing, they're using um, they're using some some meters to measure water quality parameters like dissolved oxygen, conductivity, temperature, of course, salinity, and a very important one in relation to climate change and in relation to sea level rise is pH. Um, the effects of climate change on the pH of the water, the acidification of the water, is fairly dramatic. And oh, see, so, yeah, so I have to show the picture in the nice weather to encourage you all to come out and volunteer for the uh, Penobscot Bay stewards and the water quality efforts. But this is just a chart showing how ocean acidification is related to climate change overall and sea level rise. And I want you to look specifically at the chart there on the left. Um, the, uh, the green, kind of the green line is the measurement of CO2 measurements. The, um, the blue line is what's important. That's the uh, dropping in pH. As the CO2 level goes up in the atmosphere, it's absorbed by the seawater the pH drops. If we can go out every week and measure pH and see what the overall trend is, we can relate that to climate change and that's going to be relatable to the sea level rise. So these two things go hand in hand. And this is something that's been going on for the last three years here in Belfast Harbor with our own local groups and for much longer in up and down the coast in the rest of the state with other citizen science groups. So this is the kind of thing where they're just collecting incredible amounts of data and they're just folks who are concerned about these things and they're very interested and they're coming out and, and helping to collect this data and fill in gaps uh, in the data that we have. Other things that we're doing in this from the citizen science perspective, we are always keeping up with um, discharges from fresh water into the bay, into the harbor uh, from things like wastewater treatment plants. We keep up with reading uh, the test results from the different wastewater treatment plants on the coast. We go out and um, we collect water samples from freshwater sources like streams and rivers that discharge into the bay. And this is all citizen science work. See, these are all just regular folks. Um, some of them have science backgrounds, but it's not required. A lot of them are just people who are interested they're concerned about the environment, they're concerned about the climate change going into the future, and they're working hard to fill in these gaps in our information. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, John. So, so now you have an idea of some of the citizen science activities that are already going on in Belfast and the kind of people who participate in them. Um, now I'd like to introduce some of the people who have been creating the physical structures and apparatus that we intend to use in this project. Uh, Dave Thomas is a science teacher at Belfast Area High School and he'll introduce some of his students who've been contributing ideas and work to get this project underway. So hi everyone, I'm Dave Thomas, like John said, and um, I'm really excited and grateful that uh, we were invited to be part of this project. And it's especially exciting that young people are interested and um, looking to contribute uh, throughout the uh, lifetime of this project. And so uh, we'll let three students uh, discuss their contributions to the project tonight. Okay, hi, my name is Haley Lindelof and I'm a senior at Belfast Area High School. And I'm connected to this project through the AP Environmental Science program at the high school. Over the past few weeks, we've worked on the posts that were installed at six sites. And last week we got to install these posts. So here are some pictures of us actually installing the post right here. And this is what the finished post have looked like. So on the post, we worked on 
painting the signs that are right here and they have instructions on them at what to do at the sites like where to take the picture and of the water line and then they have brochures that outline the project more in detail and then these are the six sites that you can find the post at that we're looking to collect data from and now I'm going to introduce Anna who will talk more about other aspects of the project um, hi, I'm Anna Shorts. I'm a junior at BHS High School, and I'm in Projects and Engineering and AP Environmental. Um, in our classes, we've been working on Arduino sensors, um, working alongside Dave Sprague, an electrical engineer. Um, we'll be placing um, these Arduino sensors along the locations on the Belfast Bay. Um, their main function is to collect more data on the tide heights in relation to climate change. Um, this will be a multi-year program. Um, our projects in engineering class will be working on designing the sensors to collect the data and um, using, as well as the Arduino boards, we'll be connecting multiple ultrasonic sensors. And these sensors in relation to the Arduino boards will be an inexpensive way to calculate tide height um, data. So, on the, so looking at the diagram, um, the sensors, I don't know, if this, the sensors up here will, um, they will bounce sound waves down to the surface of the water, and um, that will. Um, <laughs> Uh, that will return back to the sensor and then the time it takes for the sound wave to bounce back will calculate um, the tide height. Um, and then the sensor will be in a um, PVC pipe which is along, which is this, um, and that has holes drilled into it which will filter out wave action so that we get a more accurate um, display of numbers for the tide height. Um, we'll also be placing an industrial grade underwater depth pressure sensor at um, one of the sites, which is right here. And um, that will measure the pressure of the water above to calculate the height, the height of the water. So both of the devices will um, give us data that will be compared, sent out, and used for analysis, which Jonah will describe more in depth. <laughs> Uh, hello Belfast, uh, my name is Jonah and I'm also a junior at Belfast Area High School and enrolled in Projects Engineering as well as in AP Environmental. So when using the sensors uh, we will be collecting lots of data on the tide levels around Belfast. Uh, the data is collected every second and then will be later averaged out. After it's uh, received by the Arduino board up here it will be transmitted to a Raspberry Pi micro, uh, microcomputer. Um, and if you look at the board, here's a, this is a visual of a Raspberry Pi, and it's basically a low cost credit card sized computer that can be plugged into a computer or a monitor. Um, here's also a visual of an Arduino board that we'll be using. This is the Arduino board, and this is like the sensor that we'll be hooking up to it. So this will be transmitted from the Arduino board uh, via LoRa uh, radio waves. Um, the LoRa radio waves can be compared to Wi-Fi wave, waves, but um, LoRa uses lower frequencies, which um, will take less power, which in our case is better, because our end goal is to power the Arduino board uh, solely on solar power, power. The data that we collect from the sensor will improve our estimates on ten tide charts and give us more accurate predictions on tide of the tides. Uh, the, the data will display analysis of long-term trends that we can look back on. Uh, we will also upload this cloud data into cloud storage where students can work on the data. We hope that by setting up this project and collecting and analyzing the data received from it, it will encourage other students and towns to partake action in their own regions. We hope that this project will give insight into the effects of climate change and rising sea levels in our bay. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, so, how can a person contribute to this project? Uh, basically, be an observer. 
take pictures of the bay and upload them onto the website uh, that our GMRI people have set up for us, um, along with your own observations about what you've seen and how flooding may affect the community. Um, Brenda Harrington with the Belfast Free Library will now walk us through how to use the Ecological Investigation Network and contribute to this project. Thank you, John, and thank you, everybody, for all your presentations and involvement. Um, so I just wanted to start with our, this is the brochure that you will find at all the sites, at the posts that they were talking about installing at the six sites around the bay. Um, on the brochure, it tells you exactly what to do and where to go, and you can use the QR code to get to the website. Um, and it's a pretty quick and handy way. You don't have to do it that way. You can take a picture and go home and log on to the website. Um, the Ecosystem Investigative Network, whoops, I wanted to get to the home page. So this is the page that Sarah and um, Gail were talking about. And our project is at the bottom, coastal flooding, storms, and sea level. And, and Belfast is one of many communities that will eventually be on this, but um, to get to our um, uh, information, you go to contribute. But before you do that, you have to go to prep and collect. And even before, well, anyway, I'll just do this part first. So um, here are the six sites, which I showed you on the brochure. They're also here on the website. So we have the boathouse is one, the breakwater, the city park, the end, east end of the Armistice Bridge, and the um, Kayla Road culvert, which is really the Robbins Road culvert, and the Stevenson Rangeway. Those are our six sites. And um, so you can choose if you hear that it's a high tide event or um, a, a storm is coming which um, site you would like to go to to, t to take a picture and contribute to our project. Um, so in order to contribute, you do need to um, log on and create an account. And to create an account, I already have an account. So this is already logged on to me. So that, I'm just going to have to walk you through that. But you just sign in with using your email and creating a password. And you can have your computer and your phone remember it so you're ready to go every time. So then when you hit, when you go to the contribute, it's got the date. And if you took the picture yesterday, you can change the date. Um, so then you're going to add the data and you're going to do the time. And, and then the drop down right here shows you to choose where you were. And um, then you, you have to, oh, one other thing I forgot to say is you have to contribute two photos. So you have to take two. It really, and then it asks you some really important questions about you know, what, was, what did you see? Is this a high, high water event? And um, then what, um, you know, what do you feel the nature of this would be the impact to the community and your level of concern? And, and then you just hit submit. Um, it's really, really simple, actually. And it's fun, and I encourage everybody to go out there and contribute to our website and help make this project um, full and, and rich and interactive and you can also one more thing you can also view the data so after you after you put something in there you can go back and view it so, and and you know uh, we haven't we've had a very mild weather but the stormy season is coming up so um, I encourage people to get excited and get ready and go out there and take some pictures and I will open up the map for you John here is this the one you want? And if you have any questions, you can email me at the library, and John will, uh, I'll put that slide up after you're done. Go and Brenda, ahead. I wasn't trying to hustle you out. No, I know. It's OK. Go ahead. So um, now we'll be happy to field questions. And again, if you want to send questions in, you can use the YouTube comment section on your computer, or you can send an email right now to bharrington 
at belfastlibrary.org. So what have we, what have we described to you? We've shown you the six four by four posts and signs embedded in a concrete post that the students at BAHS have made. We've shown you the plan for collecting all the data. We've showed you that the National Weather Service is going to feed us information when it suspects a high water event. One of the reasons they're doing that is because they want to see how accurate their predictions are. So if they predict a high water event and it doesn't happen, they need to know that. So, for instance, in the last 24 hours, I've gotten three different alerts from the National Weather Service about Hurricane Teddy and the high weather they're expecting to happen, the high water. So we'll be out there looking and see what happens. Before we open up for questions, though, I also want to say that we're not just interested in these six sites. We chose these six sites because we wanted to set up posts for observations, and these were six sites that looked ripe for high water events. However, there are hundreds of other sites all around Belfast Bay which might be as just as good for observing it. If you know of a place that you'd like to observe and create a series of um, pictures and observations, we would very much welcome that. The only difficulty you'll find is that instead of being able to mark on the form that Brenda showed you, clicking off one of the six places, you have to put the GPS reading of where you are. But most people's cameras, or rather iPhones, can give them the GPS reading. So um, we absolutely invite you to take pictures wherever you think there's a good spot to study. So if you want to participate in the project, you can, we can send you an email alert, like the ones I've gotten today from the National Weather Service. To do that, send an email to us at belfast.cit.sci at gmail. In other words, Belfast Citizen Science. So, um, I don't know if we've described very clearly this project, but uh, we'd welcome any questions. Yes, Ned. Um, when I saw that tide gauge level thing, I said, I can't wait till it's 20 below zero and the ice gets in there. I was wondering if you're concerned about getting accurate measurements in the depths of winter. Yes, I mean, weather is going to affect the tide gauge, uh, not only in that way by having ice impeding, but just the speed of sound uh, and the density of water are different in different temperatures. So we'll need to adjust our calculations. There, with respect to the ice, I'm going to talk to the NOAA people who run the, Belf the uh, Booth Bay Harbor uh, tide gauge, which is exactly the same design as, as we've made, um, and see how they handle that. Uh, clearly, we won't be inventing the wheel here. We have centuries of work to, to build on. Any other questions? Will the public be able to access this data on sea level rise in Belfast? A couple of different tranches of data. The data that we are creating to put onto the EIN will be available to anybody who signs up and gets a password to go on. Um, all of the pictures and observations that are being submitted will be there available for looking at. On the other hand, we've sort of adverted to, but not very, very um, precisely, the fact that we have a weather station. We've had a weather station on the pier now for over six months, almost a year. And uh, we have a tide gauge, which is almost installed now, just waiting for the sensors to be built and installed by the students. That information is all being collated uh, on Weather Underground, the, the weather information is, and is available and will be, as the students said, will be stored uh, permanently and available for study. Um, in fact, there are a lot of fishermen who check with our weather station before they come down to work in the morning so they can see where the wind is and, and see if it's worth coming down. So yes, this is a city-funded project and it is definitely for public availability. Also, can I say something about that? Uh, so the, yeah, okay. 
So the high school students, part of our plan is to also uh, make a website so that the data will be accessible, not only the data from the ultrasonic sensors above the water level, but also the um, underwater water pressure sensor. And so, you know, over time, we'll look to uh, correlate those values and we'll get more accurate and we'll also be able to upload that data so that viewers can see it in real time. So one of the, one of the things that we're trying to do here is to get a record of what actually is happening in the water of Belfast Bay. The tide predictions are made from Bar Harbor. That's the closest NOAA gauge to Belfast. So all of our predictions, both as to height and surge, are based on extrapolations from Bar Harbor. Uh, those extrapolations are based on information from 1983 to 85 when we had a tide gauge temporarily in Belfast. So what we're looking to do is to see as sea level rise and climate change uh, continue, to see what if any effects that we're having on the actual effects of weather and water in Belfast. And again, the reason for this is so that we can plan and observe and uh, make provision for the changing world. Ned. When I heard the discussion about the Belfast Bay Water uh, volunteers uh, doing pH testing, I couldn't help but wonder if there was also being a study on the shell density of like the mussels in the area, because one of the things I've heard is that the lower the pH, the more difficult it is for shellfish and mollusks to build shells, and it would be really interesting to know if the density of shells changes in our community. John, do you want to respond to that? Are you able to? Uh, uh, he, and Ned's asking whether or not our, the observations uh, regard, regarding acidification correlate to changes in shell uh, thickness or strength? Well, th there should be a correlation when we have enough data, yes, and that is a common way to um, support the pH readings that are being taken. Yes, shell, th shell thickness of the juvenile bivalves is directly related to the pH of the water and the surrounding sediment. And are, you, are there being studies done in the bay of the shell density at, along with the pH to sort of see the correlation? Y yes, most of the studies that are being done right now, especially the citizen science meetings, aren't necessarily for shell density, but just um, overall abundance of bivalve species. And then that data, if we find areas where there are decreases in the populations of the bivalves, then we can, we can send uh, sent specimens to scientists with the proper facilities to actually conduct shell density and thickness experiments. Yeah. We have a question. Uh, is, a viewer asks, is one site more important than the others? Is one site more important than the others? Um, I would say that all six sites have different qualities. For instance, the one at the boathouse, site number two. Um, a lot of us have been concerned for years about whether or not that boathouse can survive with sea level rise. So certainly observing how surge and storm waves and wind affect that boathouse will be helpful to the city in making a determination. Um, likewise, if you look at site number five, which is Robbins Road, Anybody who stands there and looks south along the Passy will see that there's not much room between the water and the road. So there will be a time when sea level rise and surge may make a decision to keep that road alive, um, make a decision required. So every site has its own qualities. Um, City Park, site number one, we had a substantial amount of erosion in 2018, which required installation of a rather expensive riprap field, um, we'll see how far up the riprap the water rises now. So each of the each of the places is uh, significant in a different way. Again, I really hope people will look at this map and say, "Geez, they should have put a post X place, some other place that they think is important to study." And we welcome you to do that. We'd love you to 
choose a place to study and compile information. Thank you very much. Good evening. <laughs>